So the first section is just factoring. So you're not solving anything, you're just factoring for me. So you don't have to set anything equal to zero, you're literally just finding common factors or breaking it up into binomials. All right, so the first thing you always wanna do, and it actually reminds you there, is don't forget to look for the common factor first. So for all of these, you're gonna look at them and say, is anything in common that I can take out first, all right? If I looked at this first one, I would say, no, I can't take anything out. No variable, no number can come out of that. So I'm just gonna go straight to my factoring. When my coefficient in the front is a one, then I just really have to look at that last term. Um, what multiplies to give me the last number and also adds to give me the middle number. That's what you're trying to find out here. And so for this one, I'm going to say, well, I have 42. That's what I'm trying to multiply, a positive 42. And I want to add to get a positive 13. And so 6 and 7 will multiply to give me a positive 42. And they will add to give me a positive 13. So I'm going to say positive 6 and positive 7. So u plus 6 and u plus seven here. And I'm done with that one. All right, I don't have to do anything else to it. All right. For something like number five, once again, I'm gonna say, do I have anything in common? And here I actually do. I can take a two out first. Don't let the fourth um, throw you. I'm actually not gonna give you any to the fourth on this particular quiz. We'll get to higher factoring later on. Um, unless it's grouping. You may have something to the fourth with grouping, but not with the, the trinomials. But if it's to the fourth, then you're just going to have an x squared and an x squared instead of an x and an x. Once I look at this, my leading coefficient is still a 1. I've taken the 2 out. This is still a 1. So I literally just have to look at this 30 and say, what are factors of 30 that multiply to give me positive 30 and add to give me negative 13? It has to be two positives and two negatives, right? So in this case, it's going to be two what? Negatives, and what are they? Negative three. negative 3 and negative 10, right? Negative 3 and negative 10. And so um, I'm going to finish that out. Leave the 2 up front when you're factoring. And you have x, in this case, squared minus 3. And x squared minus 10 because it was x to the 4th. Um, but once again, you're going to have all just squares there once you get to your, get your common factor out. The last type on this first page is the four term polynomials. When you see four terms, you do wanna factor by grouping. I do want to look and see if I have a common factor because there could be a time when something goes into all four of these numbers. For this one, we don't have a common factor. So I'm gonna go straight to factor by grouping. And so I will group the first two and group the last two. And then I'm just gonna look for a common factor within the group. And so I'll look at this first group and say, well, between the 20 and the 4, I know that a 4 can come out. And between the n cubed and the n squared, I know that an n squared can come out. And I'm left with 20 divided by 4 is 5. I took out two of my n's, so I have one left over. 4 divided by 4 is 1. I took both of my n's out. Then I'm going to always put that plus sign and look for what I can take out the second group. If nothing will come out of the second group, just put a 1. But if something will come out, we're going to factor that out as well. So between the 25 and the 5, I can see that a 5 will come out. 25 divided by 5 is 5. I did not take any ends. And then 5 divided by 5 is 1. When you factor by grouping, you should notice that your groups look the same. All right? And so I'm going to continue factor, factoring by taking out that common group. The com thing in common now is the group. And so I'm going to say, let's take this group out. And then what do I have left over? Well, I have the 4n squared plus the 5. And now I am done with that factoring as well. So the first two that I pulled on this page... Um, Again, I'm going to look for a common factor first, but you'll also notice that even when I pull out a common factor, I no longer have a 1 um, in front like I did on the ones on the first page. So if I look at the first one, I do have a common factor, but it's just an x. And so if I take the x out, I have 3x squared now, 7, and I took out 1x, and 6, and I took out 1x. So I can no longer just look at that 6 because I still have to consider that 3 in front. And so now we're going to actually split it up 
into factoring by grouping. So we're going to multiply the 3 and the negative 6. We'll say negative 18. And I want factors of negative 18 that add up to give me positive 7. Yeah, so if I have a positive 9 and a negative 2, those will multiply to give me negative 18, and they will add to give me positive 7. And so I am going to rewrite this with those two factors. So I'm going to leave the x out here. He's still there. I'm going to keep the 3x squared. I'm going to change that 7x to be a 9x and a negative 2x. And then I'm going to leave that negative 6 alone. And all I've done is rewritten that trinomial into four terms. And now I'm going to factor that trinomial just like I did the other four term, um, which is now a four term. I'm going to factor it with all my four terms by grouping. So I'm going to group the first two, and I'm going to group the last two. But remember, when I group behind a minus, I need to change this sign. Whatever it is, I'm going to make it the opposite. So I'm going to change that to a plus 6 because I grouped behind a minus. It's like I pulled out a negative there. And now I'm going to continue factoring. I'm going to leave this x here. I'm going to look between the 3 and the 9. A 3 can come out. Between the x squared and the x, an x can come out. And I'm left with 1x plus 3. I'm going to bring down that minus. And then between the 2x and the 6, a 2 can come out. And I'm left with x plus 3. Then I'm going to finish up my grouping. Don't forget that you did pull out a common factor, so that needs to stay there. Then what I have in common is now my group. And what I have left over is my other group, 3x minus 2. And that would be my answer here. I am finished. All right, for number 17, again, I'm going to look and see if I have anything in common. Between 4, 12, and 9, I actually don't have anything in common. And so if it doesn't have anything in common, I'm going to go straight to that second step. My leading coefficient is not a 1, so I cannot just look at the 9. I have to consider the 4. So I am going to multiply across. 4 times 9 is 36. And I need factors of 36 that multiply, I mean, that multiply to give me positive 36, but add to give me negative 12. Negative 12. And so I'm going to think about, well, what can I add to get negative 12? Um, and I'm actually going to have the same number here, right? What's in common? Well, it's a negative 6 and a negative 6, all right? Another way you can look at this, this is a special case, all right? This is a special case. We had a special case where if this is a perfect square and this is a perfect square, you can look at those. This type of special case, you can factor both ways. You can factor by grouping or you can go straight to your special case. All right? My special case says, well, if I have a perfect square, I'm going to take the square root of this first one, which would be the square root of 4 is 2 and the square root of x squared is x. And I'm going to take the square root of the last one. Square root of 9 is 3. And I'm going to double check it. 2x times 3 is 6x. If I double it, I get that 12x. So I know that's the correct factoring. And so just use the sign in the middle, and it is a perfect square. Let's say you don't remember that. You don't remember that special case. You can go back to this factoring, and you can factor by grouping. Rewrite it. 4x squared minus 6x minus 6x plus 9. All right, group it just like we did the other one. I grouped behind a negative, so I have to change that to a negative. Between the 4 and the 6, I have a 2 in common. Between the x squared and the x, I have an x in common. And I'm going to divide both of those by the 2. Between the 6 and the 9, I have a 3 in common. And I'm going to divide those by the 3. And then you'll see that I have 2x minus 3, and what's left here is also 2x minus 3, and these two are the same thing because it was a special case. So for this type of special case, if you don't remember, then you can say, well, I can factor by grouping. 
At the bottom of this page, you also have the other type of special case. It is called the difference of two squares. All right. The only way you could possibly do this without remembering the special case is to think about the fact that you may be able to rewrite it like this. Right? Factors of 25 that multiply to give you negative 25 and add up to give you zero are going to be your end terms there. But if you see a perfect square minus a perfect square, it will always factor this way. You take the square root of the first one. Well, the square root of 9 is 3. The square root of x squared is x. You take the square root of the second one. That is 5. And you are going to do that with a plus and a minus. You're going to say plus, And you're going to say minus. All right? Because if you try to factor this by grouping, you're going to have to multiply that 9 by that 25. And that's going to be a pain. Right? So if you think about it this way, it may remind you that if you end up with that zero, you're going to end up with the positive and the negative of those roots. All right? So this is a special case that you may see, and it will stump you if you do not remember that it is a special case. When it says solve, you need to factor it, but then you're not done, okay? So you're going to do the same process that we've been doing this whole time, but you are not going to be done when you factor it. You need to continue and set each factor equal to zero. Um, before you even start, you need to make sure this guy is equal to zero. We're going to do one where it is and one where it isn't, but you need to make sure it's equal to zero so that you can do this factoring. If it is equal to zero, you can go ahead and start and factor exactly the way you would on the first page. I want factors that multiply to give you negative six and add to give you negative five. This one actually usually throws people a little bit. Negative six and one. Right, negative six and one. People tend to want to do two and three here because they think of five, right? But um, negative two and negative three um, will give you a positive six, right? And so negative six and positive one are your factors here. So you're gonna say x minus six, x plus one equals zero. And you can do a quick double check. Negative 6 times 1 is negative 6. Negative 6 plus 1 is negative 5. We did that factoring correctly. You're not done, though, because it wants you to solve. Solve means that you have to actually tell me what x equals. So we're going to set each factor equal to 0, and we are going to solve for x. So once we solve for x, we will get that x equals 6, or x equals negative 1. And we are done. When we look at 23, you'll notice it is not equal to zero. And so I have to force that by subtracting the three over before I ever start. All right, and so I'm gonna rewrite this so that I have it equal to zero by subtracting that three. And then I can factor just like I did on the first pages, the first and second pages. Um, since my leading coefficient is not a 1, like it was on number 19, I can do my multiplication. 10 times negative 2 is negative 20. Factors that multiply to give you negative 20 and add to give you positive 1 are positive 5 and negative 4. Positive 5 times negative 4 is negative 20. Positive 5 plus negative 4 is positive 1. And so I'm going to rewrite this using those factors. And then I can factor by grouping, just like I did before. And remember, I if I group behind a subtraction, change that last sign. It was a minus. I'm going to change it to a plus. And then I just do my standard factoring. Between 10 and 5, a 5 will come out. Between v squared and v, a v will come out. 10 divided by 5 is 2. I took out 1v. 5 divided by 5 is 1. I took out 1v. Put your minus sign there. Bring that minus sign down. Between the 4 and the 2, I can take out a 2. And I'm left with 2v plus 1. Then I'm going to finish off my factoring by setting up my groups. My first group is the 2v plus 1. What's left over is my second group, 5v minus 2. And now I'm ready to set each one of those equal to 0. 
2v plus 1 equals 0, 5v minus 2 equals 0. Finish your solving. Subtract 1. Divide by 2. Add 2. Divide by 5. All right. And I'm going to get that v equals negative one half or two fifths. All right, solving by taking the square root. Really, this is even simpler than the factoring. You get the squared variable by itself and then just take the square root, all right? And so for this first one, in order to get the square by itself, I have to subtract that four first. I get 16x squared equals four. Then I'm gonna divide by 16. X squared equals, you can reduce it, that's one fourth. And then take the square root of both sides. X equals, and you can think of it like this, the square root of one over the square root of four, where the square root of one is one, the square root of four is two. Because a variable was involved, you have to consider the positive and the negative root. Positive one half, negative one half. You will have two answers for all of these unless you end up having the square equal to zero, because zero is only gonna have one root, right? But other than that, you're gonna have positive and negative roots here. All right. I pulled the next one for a reason, because I want you to see, first of all, reducing the fractions again, and also an imaginary number. You can have imaginary numbers on these. If I subtract the four over, I have 10x squared equals negative 15. Divide by that 10. I have x squared equals, you can reduce it. 15 divided by five is three. 10 divided by five is two. And I'm gonna take um, the square root of both sides here. Now, this is, you can do it the same way, the square root of negative three over the square root of two, all right? When you have a negative inside your root, you do have to consider the fact that that is going to be an imaginary number. So for this guy right here, I'm gonna pull an i out to get that negative out of the root, and I have that square root of three, all right? Three and two actually don't reduce. You can't simplify those radicals. You could simplify something like eight, two, two, and two, and so a pair of twos will come out, one will stay in, something like that. But three and two don't. But one thing you do have to remember is that we do not like having radicals in the denominator. That is not considered simplified. So you would miss points here if you left it like this. You have to multiply the top and the bottom by that square root of two. That's how you get rid of a square root, all right, and so to get rid of the square root in the denominator, you multiply by the square root that is in the denominator. And just like any fraction, whatever you multiply the denominator by, you have to multiply the numerator by. And so your final answer here, you still have, by the way, that plus or minus. You still have positive and negative. You still have your i. On the top, you have three times two, that is six. On the bottom, you have square root of two times square root of two. Well, that is just two. Anytime you make, multiply a square root by itself, you get what was left in it. The radical goes away. And also, one thing I want to remind you, the two is outside of a square root. The six is inside a square root. I cannot reduce these. You can only reduce outside to outside, inside to inside. Okay, so I cannot reduce the two, two and the six because one is inside of a radical and one is outside of a radical. So I'm actually done here. This is my final answer for this one. And so I am done with that one. All right, this first section wants you to find the absolute value. You do need to remember your formula for absolute value. It's rather simple. 
It is the square root of a squared plus b squared. And remember, it is a plus bi. A is the real part of it, and b is the coefficient in front of your imaginary piece. All right? So for this one, I'm just going to plug it in. The square root, my a is negative 1. My b is negative 10. All right, these will always be positive because you're squaring numbers and adding them. So you're not going to have an imaginary number as an absolute value here. So I'm going to end up with 1 plus 100, square root of 101. If I could simplify that, like use my factor tree and take something out, I would. But actually, 101 cannot be simplified in a radical. So that is my answer here. Square root of 101 is my answer. And so I'm done here with this particular one. All right, addition and subtractions, simple. Combine your like terms, combine your real portions, combine your imaginary portions, okay? And so for this first one, I am literally just gonna add the negative four and the two, technically I'm subtracting, so negative four minus two is going to give me negative six. That's gonna be my real portion of it. All right, so negative four minus two gives me negative six. And then I'm gonna subtract the imaginary portion, negative five i minus, again, negative two i. And remember, we're subtracting, so it's adding the opposite. Negative five i plus two i is what it ends up being. So my imaginary piece is negative three i, and I am done. Combine your, your real parts, combine your imaginary parts by addition or subtraction, whatever it says in the middle, all right? For multiplication, treat it like it's an X till the very end, all right? Just like you would FOIL anything. I'm going to say 5 times negative 7, 5 times negative 2i, negative 7i times negative 7, and then negative 7i times negative 2i. Now, here's where it is different. All right, so for this one, I need to change this. I have a positive 14 times I squared. I squared is negative one. So that positive 14 I squared is actually negative 14. So now my like terms are negative 35 and negative 14. So my real portion is negative 49. And my imaginary portion is this negative 10i plus 49i. And so I am done here. I cannot combine the real and the imaginary. I am finished with this complex number as well.